Hello everyone and welcome to this the 30th edition of the Modern Woodworkers Association online discussion of all things woodworking. You may notice that this is Diami Plotki speaking. Our esteemed shop monkey Tom Iovino was unable to make it because tomorrow he's going to be teaching more people how to stay safe in a hurricane. So you have to bear with me this episode. Um, tonight I have as always Mr. Chris Adkins and our special guest who's going to be filling in for the entire episode in Tom's absence is Mike Pekovic of uh, fine woodworking. Thanks so, for having me, guys. Go thanks ahead, for coming on. on, Mike. Appreciate it. We're going to jump right into it. We're, we're trying to trim the intro, and I'm going to babble on here a little bit more to give Chris something to edit out later. Uh, but we're going to jump right into what's in the shop. So, Chris, what's going on on your bench right now? Come on, Diami. Would I ever edit <laughs> you guys out? I mean, really? <laughs> Maybe. I edit my own I just want to make you work. You know, I edit my own self also because I, I hear myself and I'm like, gosh, I sound like such a hick. Yeah, that's got to come out. <laughs> so, um, I am, I finished up, um, finished up the chisel cabinet and got that on the wall, got all the finish on it. And, and I've been working on, uh, working on a humidor. Um, that's been a cool little project. I, I took, um, it's Spanish cedar on the inside and then the outside, uh, I think I may have talked about this a little bit last time, but I've got the, the veneer on it. I used um, um, I used uh, a locust. I had a really old locust post that was probably two and a half inches thick by about eight inches wide, and wow. I sliced it into end grain veneer and cleaned oh, the edges cool. up just enough to fit, and it's really cool looking. It, it turned out awesome. So I've, I've got the whole veneer on all the sides, and then because the veneer is a little weak and I cut it a little thicker because I was concerned about the the end grain on it. Right. I uh, I ripped the corners off, so I left like a three eighths rip all the way around the corners of it, and then put a piece of three eighths uh, wingy on the corners to basically edge band it. And uh, oh, the, nice. the locust has got a dark kind of deep rich color to it, so it, it's a real nice contrast with the uh, with the wingy on it. So it's real pretty. That, mm -hmm. That's cool. I love that end grain look. Matt Kenny has goofed around with that a little mm -hmm. bit. We had a piece on the back cover a while back where a guy did a whole cabinet with end grain. It's really stunning stuff. It's amazing how much, um, you know, just the look. I mean, you you don't expect some of the, the look that it has and just, you know, you, you think of the end grain a lot of times it's just kind of, you know, just strawy looking just the, the end. But uh, it can have some just stunning effects if it's, the, if it's the right wood on it. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little slow to the draw here, but for anyone who does happen to be watching, oh, here's a picture of the cabinet, yeah. or of the humidor, rather, excuse me. Now, you built it as a box, and then you're cutting it open. Is that right, Chris? Yes, I built so it. So in uh, this, mm -hmm. I see a little horizontal line in this picture, but that's not a cut. That's just a, a mark in the end grain, right? Or have it you is. cut it open yet? No, I've not cut it open. Uh, a matter of fact, it's I, I actually, the cedar box is all six sides completely um, put together, so it's not cut open at all. And then the end grain is applied with it still completely together. The corner was applied with it. And then because it's end grain and, and it was such an old piece, I, I didn't want to take all the, the um, you know, you've got some of the fissures and stuff in the edge of the board where it's just so old. I didn't want to lose all that because it does kind of kind of crack into the center of the board just a little bit. So I only planed enough off just to square the corners up so they fit tight together. Um, so after it was all put together and it's still not cut open, I've epoxied the whole thing to fill in any of those little little cracks and fissures and stuff through it. And then now I'm going to slice it open next. And then, and then after that, I'll just put a finish on it. I've got some hinges that go on there. And then I'll line the inside of it again with more cedar. Oh, okay. It's nice. Yeah. I like how you uh, book match that end grain and how it wraps from the front across the top. Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's and it's actually I, I book matched it to where the the grain turns to the center, and then for the two outside ones, I I flipped them out the other way. So so they book match the opposite directions on it. So all the grain lines up like four pieces. It goes across the side of it and across the top. So awesome. Yeah, awesome. turned it kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah, it's really neat. Can I ask you a question about the chisel cabinet before we move on? Yeah. I want to make a rasp cabinet, mm -hmm. but I've realized that you can't hook the handle of the rasp the way you can hook the handle of your chisels. Right. So I was just, I was thinking the other day, what am I going to do to 
to hang the rasp and if I have to actually rest them on something or can I hang them on? So either one of you have a good way to, to hang it when I can't quite grab underneath the handle the way you can with a chisel? Hmm. So are your rasp, are you... Are your, have you got rasp with the handles on them? I mean, I guess what do you... What yeah, all my rasps rasp have using? handles. I've got uh, the Aruz, Aruz, I, I could never pronounce right. the damn things. I've got them. No, it's I, unpronounceable. Yeah, I've got those French ones that are really yes. nice and expensive. <laughs> and I've got some from the Czech Republic that are not so nice and not so expensive. Um, and what I find is that the way the, I, I guess it's still a tang, attaches to the handle, there's just not that overlap to hook underneath. The handle is almost the same diameter as the top of the rasp. So I'm thinking I need to have the bottom rest on something. But, you know, just aesthetically, I wanted all the handles to line up, and they're all different lengths. So I'd have to make stops that are up and down to make them line up. And it doesn't really matter if they line up, I guess. But I, I thought it'd be nice to have them hang rather than, than rest. But this is really a first-world problem that I want my rasps to be lined up properly inside the case. Oh, that's sounds... the opposite. What if you turn the handles down and just put the handles like in a little indent and just kind of leaned up so that, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a way just to line it up that way. Because, but I mean, even, to be honest, even in that chisel cabinet, I put the bar across where the they hang. I don't know if you can pull that up, do you want me or not? Uh, yeah, give me a second. You've got to. Just keep talking. Um, there's, when even when they hang, even with like the different, Within the same manufacturer of chisels, they still don't hang the same because you know they've got different <laughs> diameter you know tangs and stuff, so they don't line up perfect. And at first, I was like, "Well, I don't like that. I want them all to line up." Just, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> they they hang. So <laughs> you just need to buy matching chisels. Um, well, if you had a, a shelf for your rasp and you just had um, you you just rip sort of uh, slots partially into the shelf, would the uh, the rasp be able to slide in sort of sideways into the slot and still be supported by the handle above the shelf? Uh, probably. Uh, I need to uh, I need to play with that a little bit more. And I'm sorry, guys, but my screen share is not working okay. right now. But I did pull up your cabinet. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that's a that's a good idea, Mike. I I could I have to I have to look at them and see if I twist them on their side if they're gonna. If they'd be able to to still catch the same way, yeah. Um, but well, without without going into too long on just my stuff, um, one thing that was kind of cool about that um, the the chisel cabinet <clears throat> was was um, I I wanted the door I, to shut and and latch, but I didn't want to put a latch on the inside of it. Right. So I built it kind of like a chrono style where you've got the upper and the the lower. Um, piece that kind of comes out and is flush with the outside face of the door. Right, and the doors and, overhang the sides, but are in set top and correct. bottom. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yes. And so what I did to to make it latch was I took um, I took a, a like a little wingay and, and cut it into a half inch dial, and then I trimmed the probably I don't know about a half inch on the on the front of it down to a three eighth dial. Okay. And then I drilled. A three eighths hole all the way through the the bottom kind of lip on there, and okay. put, and then drilled a half inch hole just a little ways up through it, so sure. that it, it kind of set up in there and the button came through. Right. And then I I took an ink pen and and took the spring out and <laughs> drilled a little hole and put the spring inside there and then put a plug in the bottom so that literally you know you it works now you know it's a ball catch essentially. And, oh, that, uh, that that's a good idea. <laughs> It was a whole lot for just this, and it's so funny because you can't see hardly anything because it's just this little black button sticking up. But uh, it worked perfect. It was, you know, I was I was pleased with with how well it ended up working. But uh, that's awesome. That's a great trick. But everyone else will look at it and be like, "It just looks like a little button to me." Yeah, <laughs> yeah but but, but woodworkers, yeah, <laughs> yeah, tell the woodworker to push it, and they'll like push that all day long trying to figure out what's going on. In that's there. right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So anyway, so what, um, Mike? What do you what have you got going on? Well, I'm actually um, Tiami's offered to uh, allow me to uh, hoist a glass of wine or a bottle of beer while I'm in the <laughs> shop. But I'm actually surrounded by hundreds of uh, sample boards covered in water locks, 
in my shop, so I'm getting ready for a finishing demo this weekend. So basically, I'm just getting a good high off my water <laughs> fumes in here. And I'm just counterbalancing that with some coffee. So um, in terms of recent projects, I just finished up a, a traveling toolkit because I am doing a lot of teaching and stuff. And I'm always hoisting my, my tools around in a canvas tote. They're banging around. So I made a little, uh, a little travel kit just for um, obviously not every tool I own, but just for sort of my essential travel kit for what I have with me when I teach or demonstrate. And uh, that's a fun project. What size is that? What's the uh, kind of dimensions? Uh, it's uh, it's about 12 inches deep. It's about just about 12 inches high, maybe about, uh, let's call it maybe 21 inches wide. The width was sized by my uh, Japanese back saw. That's like the longest tool that I own, so I needed it long enough to fit in there. And that... So and then basically, that's where I determine one dimension. I have a uh, plain till up top and a couple of doors uh, for all nice. my chisels and stuff down below. So, nice. Yeah, it's, it's kind of neat. And um, it seems like, like everything in my shop has either been in the magazine or is going in the magazine in terms of, you know, you just, if you have to come up with a prop for, you know, drawing a cabinet maker's triangle on door parts. Well, you don't want to just rip four door parts and then just throw them into the corner. So it's like, okay, I'll make a real door. Well, if I have a door, I got to make a case for it to go in. <laughs> and if it has a case, it's going to have some drawers too. So, um, and then Wait, that you're the one actually. A, you don't put drawers behind your doors. Is that right? That's the side of that <laughs> argument you fall on. Yes, I, I am morally opposed to drawers behind doors. It's like, what are you trying to hide there? So, no, this I, I'm 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 uh, more often putting drawers below doors. I think that's perfectly acceptable. So, <laughs> this one uh, fundamentals uh, department I'm uh, photographing on doing cabinet maker's triangle has turned into a pair of um, wall cabinets for a bathroom. Um, so that's what I've got in the shop right now. Nice. <laughs> Sounds like a good problem to have. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But you know, it's I mean, it's the same way. It's like when I made that that chisel cabinet. Really, the the entire reason I ended up starting on it, rather than the fact that I needed one, was was that I had um, I was doing this kind of design and 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 figuring out how to do. Um, I'm going to be doing a table, and the table in the middle of it, I wanted like a river design down the center, so that it oh, kind nice. of. And it then it goes all the way through, so it's not just an inlay; it's actually all three pieces are laminated together. Um, so I was coming up with just you know how to do that the most you know efficient way, and and so I made a panel, and the panel was exactly the size of like a panel for a door that I needed. So I'm like, hmm, I know what I should use this for. <laughs> so. So I ended uh, up just using. I finally got that yeah. to post, so you can see in the picture if anyone's watching. That's that oh, awesome. reverse uh, piece he was going for. Okay. So now, Chris, since the home for those tables you're going to build is no longer there, uh, you're welcome to put one in my dining room because I can use it. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I I'm actually just going to use one of those as my own my own desk now. So you yeah, absolutely should. That's a really nice piece. I see it looks like you got a really nice wide Japanese chisel there in the lower right hand corner. Yeah. yeah there's a there's a couple of couple of Japanese on the bottom there. That that the one in the that you're pointing at the 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 wide one there. I think I picked that up at a I don't remember where I got it. Some flea market or something like that. And, and you know, it's actually got the stamp of the guy who you know forged it. Yeah, and I think I bought it for like a couple of dollars. Wow! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> now, Chris, I know you've talked about those chisels you have that I think a friend of your dad's made. Yes. Are All they right. hanging in here? No, and I'm still I haven't figured out exactly what to do. Um, yeah, I've got three chisels that that a uh, a, a friend of our family's he's a it's a super, you know, a great blacksmith, and um, he made when I was, I was, I don't know, I was a teenager, I guess. He made us three chisels out of, you know, it's pre World War II steel and just, you know, phenomenal chisels. But wow. the problem is, is they're they don't have they don't have handles on them. They're straight, you know, just straight steel chisels, um, and there's really not a good way for me to put handles on them the way that they're made. Um, so I'm I'm actually going to have to make 
I think what I'm going to do is just make like some um, horizontal, you know, pieces to go across, and I'll probably put them on the door. Is I think what, is what I'm going to end up doing with them. What about just a magnetic strip? I could. And you could embed the magnets in a piece of wood, like um, mm -hmm. I think Benchcrafted. That's mm -hmm. where they, they started with knife. those strips. Yeah, I'm not gonna do it that way. Matter of fact, that's actually the way I typically store them. Is I've got a, um, I've got a magnet bar on the wall that I typically keep those chisels on. All right. Well, there's not too much re to report for my shop this week. I managed to prime two sides of the treehouse, and that was my most of my <laughs> weekend. But I'll tell you, T111 is unbelievably porous. It took me two gallons to prime. Yeah, I bet. It's it's eight by. 12. It's eight by twenty. The area I had to prime, and I, it took every drop of two gallons of primer. Um, and that was the easy side off the deck. So now I have to set up scaffolding to, to prime and paint the rest. Oh, no. But um, at least by the end of this summer, the kids will have a treehouse. There you go. T one eleven's good stuff, um, but you're right; it's super porous. Yeah, it's it's super porous, but it's it's sheathing and siding in one. So you no, know, it's it's perfect for a treehouse. Yeah, it is. Um, but anyway. Um, Enough about our shops. Uh, w this is where we would normally talk about blog posts that have piqued our interest, but we'll simply tease everyone by saying that the newsletter is to come, and the newsletter will be mentioning uh, some really interesting posts. And if it's not yet, Chris, please add interesting posts to the newsletter before you publish it. No, it's actually actually one of the things I was going to say about the newsletter is um, is I've already started getting some some articles in from um, listeners and readers to add to that so uh, I mean I've got a couple of things that some guys sent me one of the guys sent me he says hey would you mind sending putting my cabinet in there and I'm like yeah sure and it's phenomenal I mean it's <laughs> unreal I'm like wow that's that's really impressive so so uh, we're, we're getting some good good feedback to send out with the newsletter so make sure if you haven't signed up for that go online and sign up through it through uh, modern woodwork association dot com that yeah, that's great. And if people want to submit things for the newsletter, that would be Modern Woodworkers Association at Gmail dot com would be the yeah. address to send that to. That's fine. You can send it to that one or High Rock or it, it doesn't. Yeah, that's that's the easiest one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, then uh, he's already with us, but let me formally introduce our guest tonight. It's Mr. Michael Pekovic, who is the 2010 Ten in Shootout champion. <laughs> Yes, that's true. I forgot about that. <laughs> I think you, uh, you you schooled Matt doing with his hand-cut tenons, and I, I, I commend you for that, sir. Yeah, never <laughs> go into a dado blade fight with a back saw, right? <laughs> yeah, it's probably not a good idea yeah. as far as timing. and. <laughs> oh. Well, for, for anyone who doesn't know, Mike, you, you're the art director for Fine Woodworking. Is that right? That's correct. And that, that means that you make the magazine pretty with all the photos in the right direction. Uh, for the most part, we try to get them facing the right way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to start with just a little bit of, about you, Mike. So how did you get into woodworking? If I, I think I know a little bit about you. We've met a couple times. Yeah. You were woodworking before you started the magazine, right? Yes. Um, I, you know, I've been goofed around in my dad's garage messed around with his tools for my whole life. But really, um, when I was supposed to be in art school and college, I stumbled into a wood shop in school and uh, realized that I could get college credit for goofing around with a bandsaw making furniture. So, you know, I officially became a furniture making major in college um, and was able to really learn most of the basics of milling lumber, cutting joinery, making furniture, trying some attempts at some uh, innovative design and um, and with the aspiration of being possibly being a furniture maker getting out of college and then when reality kind of hit I said well let's uh, why don't we go back to school for graphic design I hear you can uh, get jobs doing that that actually pay so um, uh, out of college I was been working for a graphic designer and then came to find woodworking um, about 16 years ago, just to sort of bring my career full circle. So um, I'm still, you know, by definition, I'd say I'm a I'm a, a graphic designer by profession, but really, you know, I'm a continuing aspiring uh, woodworker. And as long as they they let me hang out there and pay me to do something, I'm more than happy just to hang out and you know 
goof around with this craft. It's pretty awesome. Okay. So, so then Fine Woodworking was your first foray into journalism. You were doing graphic design and the kind of art direction type stuff, but not... Yeah. Yeah, actually, I um, in college and then out of college, I sort of segued from uh, art into music. I was in a band. I was in a kind of a three-piece post-punk rock pre-grunge band on the West Coast. And uh, it's a very um, specific genre. It is. Yes, it's sort of yeah, it's right there. Um, and uh, anyway, so coming out of there, that's when I went back to school when uh, the second record label we were on actually went under and the thought of, you know, going back in and cutting another demo and shopping it around. I was turning 29 and feeling as old as the hills saying, I got to get a real job. So I uh, went back to graphic design school. And um, actually when I got out, I got a job at Vans Shoes in California that makes skateboard shoes mm -hmm. and snowboard boots and stuff. So um, it was really quite a bit different than what I'm doing at Fine Woodworking, but it was just enough of a portfolio to convince them that I could actually do magazine work as okay. well. So. so so, any chance that you're going to bring the band back together to uh, be the entertainment at Fine Woodworking Live this coming year? <laughs> yeah, when, you, when, when the build-off uh, is going on, live music in the background would be really cool. Okay, we can work that in. Actually, there's quite a few musicians around the uh, office, so um, I'm not even sure I put myself at the top of the heap, but um, we had a little jam session last uh, last li live uh, fine woodworking live there. That's true. Yeah, Ace is not afraid to break out the old six string and play us a song. That's right. So. That's right. <laughs> so, so speaking of uh, fine woodworking live, what what will yeah. you um, what do you want to talk about? Uh, kind of what you're going to be doing there and teaching, and kind of a little bit about what you're going to be doing at the show. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, last time around, we basically uh, funneled everyone through six sort of, you know, mandatory class schedule, and then the last day was uh, elective day. And that was easy, so I knew I was basically doing a, uh, I, shoot, I think I was doing like a sharpening class, um, like, you know, three times a day for two days, and I was just beat at the end of that. This time, it's all elective, so there's a lot more classes offered, and you can sign up for whatever you want on any day. And so instead of just the two classes I did last time, I think I, I put my name in the hat for three different classes. And depending on who signs up, I'm not sure if I'll be teaching one, two, or three of those. Um, I want to do something beyond just getting a hand plane sharp, sort of like here, is based on a smoothing plane. Let's say you got a smoothing plane, you can get decent shavings, but you're still not exactly where you want to be with it. Maybe tricky woods give you uh, some problems, or maybe you're getting plane tracks you want to get rid of. Uh, so I want to do a um, uh, hand plane tune-up. I think I want to do something on, <clears throat> maybe it was on uh, like the details of uh, arts and crafts furniture uh, details, and maybe actually cut a few joints during the class. I would love to get my hands on it and actually do some woodworking during one of the demonstrations, because that's a lot of fun. And uh, there was an, another one in there as well. It, it slips my mind, but I think if you go to, to the website and somehow track down Find Woodworking Live, I'm pretty sure there's a, a list of, of classes. And actually, I would honestly, I kind of wish I wasn't teaching, because there's a lot of good guys that are doing some really interesting things that um, I'm kind of bummed out that I get to go, but at the same time, I'm sort of stuck in a classroom and having to listen to myself talk instead of seeing Michael Fortune bend giant pieces of ash or Steve Lotta do mm. his stuff. So uh, you guys were, were there last year. Did, were you there? I, I know we hung out for dinner. I don't know how much of the show you guys were able to see. I was unfortunately only able to see uh, see Friday. Um, oh, okay. But I was uh, there right, Chris, every day. Chris was there the whole time. It was great. I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was uh, some really, really great uh, and interesting classes so I, I very much enjoyed it matter of fact you know I've it, it's nice because I've done you know quite a few of the different woodworking shows with 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 everybody and stuff and there's a few of them that that I've got you know we've had a booth at or something like that uh -huh. and it's so fun to get and sit and talk to people but I love sitting in the classes and just you know just learning with everybody else and just getting out there and you know it's great sitting here talking to people but at the same time I want to be in the classes too and, and learning so uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to going up there again this year and oh good 
Good. And it's a neat area. I mean, the whole sort of New Haven area is really cool and um, should be a good venue. But yeah, and last time around, we sort of had to do a regimented schedule. And we did get a lot of comments that, that folks getting together didn't really have the chance to sort of hang out and talk with each other. So we're definitely going to give people a little more opportunity to do that. And yeah. really for me, sort of the surprise, and it shouldn't have been, but the thing I, I liked most about the show was getting to meet and talk to the guys because um, it it's a special kind of guy who who wants to uh, head out to a woodworking show. That's their idea of a good time. It's like sitting watching someone sharpen a chisel. <laughs> but, you know, if you can find that guy, they're, they're usually pretty interesting to talk to. So I'm definitely looking forward to for, that again. Right. Especially yeah, for a weekend. You know, it's not like you're going to the woodworking shows where you're going to walk through it and you spend an hour in there and you – go back home, you know, you're spending the entire weekend just doing nothing but woodworking. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it takes right. some, some, you got some dedication and uh, it's a great group really is. Yeah. yeah, I would absolutely agree with both of you. I've said this many times, but it's the community of these events that makes them so special. The, yeah. What you learn is, is fantastic on its own right, but what really makes them special events that are worth traveling to is the community and the fact that you're spending a whole weekend with a bunch of other people who completely share their passion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as a woodworker, as you know, we tend to be solitary folks. You know, we're sort of in our own shops, and every now and then we come up into the sunlight out from beneath our rocks, and it's like, wow, there's there's more of us. You know, there's yeah. some people <laughs> like me out there. So that's, that's right. pretty cool. All right. Well, what prompted us to bring you on in the first place, Mike, was to talk about the new release of Fine Woodworking Best Workshops. So, yes. um, I'm going to now quiz you about your workshop because I think okay. your workshop is featured in here. It's actually somewhat similar to my own shop, and I think it's just the fundamentals of what you've done to convert your shop into a usable space are pretty universal to lots of people who have roughly finished shops. Um, yeah. So I'm going to jump. Well, let me preface this. You had a you have a detached garage that's uh, CMU blocks into block yes. uh, construction. And you've you insulated the floor, the ceiling, and the walls as part of your renovation a few years ago. Yes. Um, I don't mean to go down a rabbit hole with technical stuff about the building, but a question I've always had since reading about your shop is, with the walls being just a single cinder block wide. Yes. Did you ha beyond the fact that you've put two layers of insulation inside them and you've hung sheetrock inside them, so it's a nice finished wall. Did you have to add any waterproofing in that layer? Do you get moisture coming through the block? Um, if it's coming through the block, it's not making it all the way into the shop. And I don't, I think it's the other way around. Um, I think I probably generate more moisture in the shop than I actually get migrating from the outside in. So, um, I know in the summertime, like in between heating and cooling seasons, the shop, it actually, and I don't have a uh, little humidity thing in here to check it out, but it feels like, you know, when it starts to get warm, it's kind of clammy warm. It feels a little bit humid, but I think it's just because this thing is sealed up really, really tight that um, there's just not a lot of moisture migration either way. And so I think just me working up a sweat in here, unfortunately, uh, probably adds enough humidity to the air where it starts to get a little bit clammy. But in terms of uh, moisture migration through the walls, um, I just, uh, so far it's not an issue. Obviously okay. it's not going all the way through the drywall. Nothing's coming up through the floor, so. Um, I'm assuming you didn't have any leaks through the walls before this started, so there should be no reason for leaks now. Right, yeah, other than where you can actually see gaps in daylight through the center block walls here and there. That was, uh, uh, theoretically, you can get some moisture through there. But no, it's, it's, um, <laughs> that's been a non-issue. Okay. So. Now, one of the things that Yummy and I have got some show notes with different questions and stuff here that we were kind of bouncing to you, but um, one of the things that just kind of popped to mind, and Diomi and I had both been up there to your shop, and one of the things I thought was one of the the great things that you did was that that you you raised the ceiling height in there, didn't you? Oh, geez, that was um, by far the best thing I did during the renovation was yeah. uh, was raise that because the uh, the bottom of the um, 
the joists were about seven and a half feet off the ground. And then when I put the insulated floor in, it really brought it, you know, closer to seven feet than seven and a half. And uh, mm -hmm. trying to move a sheet of plywood around or an eight foot board around okay. and trying right. to dodge the fluorescent lights hanging down from there. It's like, mm -hmm. forget it. I, I busted a few light bulbs in the past. So, uh, yeah, I just, and it seemed like such a daunting task because I'm not a home building kind of guy. Uh, so major construction work was really pretty scary for me. But um, the good and bad thing about working down the hall from the guys at Fine Home Building, they will talk you into trying anything. <laughs> oh, it's easy. No, 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 no. All you got to do. And so sure enough, there I was. And I just sort of, you know, I cut one tie, trimmed it to size. I hoisted it up two feet, nailed it in place with my cool pass load, you know, cordless framing nailer that I got from home. Depot as a rental and just went on down the line and in the afternoon I raised my ceiling by two feet and that was mm -hmm. like uh, you know obviously something beyond what I figured my my skills and capabilities were but sometimes you know necessity is the mother of just getting it done so yeah, yeah. So, now, so now you've gone from just over seven to just over nine feet Yes, actually, I think I, I probably raised it maybe 18 inches or so. I, I, I have a, a solid nine feet, so it's nice. Okay. I could lean uh, eight foot boards up, plywood is That's not perfect. a problem. And it just, it's a small shop. I mean, the outside dimensions, I think, are 20 by 20 to the outside. But, you know, then you have the center block wall plus four inches of insulation and drywall. And I'm closer to, uh, closer to 18 and a half feet square on the inside, which is yeah. not big. But um, definitely the high ceiling gives it a, a bigger sense of space and it's real comfortable. Place when to you work. talk about losing that that space, correct me if I'm wrong, but at least my experience has been I'm giving up I'm giving up like six inches of yeah. wall in my installation, but it's tremendously worth it in terms of the benefit you get from having an insulated shop. So, you know, you you, you steal a little bit, but it's it's all a compromise. But to give up that little bit of, of footprint around the outside to have a shop that's actually warm and dry is well worth it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you're trading a slightly larger two-season shop for a slightly smaller four-season shop, and that's a trade-off we make any day. Because my shop really, before and after the, the remodel, if you look at the tools I own, my workbench, uh, my machinery, the layout, things didn't really change that much. It was basically exactly the same shop. And the, the thing that fundamentally changed was um, getting it insulated enough to heat um, and cool and also get plenty of light in here. And those two things just to, you know, make it a habitable space. I think that's, um, you know, 90% 90, 90 of what goes into a good shop. And uh, coming from California, I mean, everyone had their shop in a garage in California. So when I was looking for a house out here, I was just looking for a house with a two-car garage. Found as a, I'm set. That's my shop. And we moved in in September. I said, this is nice. And then all of a sudden, like, November and December came around. It's like, oh, this is why it's people put their shops in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I live with that situation for, I don't know, um, so probably like maybe 10 or 12 years, I, I just dogged along with it. And, of course, we had a big shop at work I was able to use, and, and quite frankly, I had sort of all my nice tools that sort of migrated to the uh, shop at work just to keep the rust off of them and uh, give me a chance to goof around during lunchtime and get some real work done. But um, with everything insulated, uh, now everything's back here, and... Um, I spend as much time out here as I can. Because do you find you're more productive at work that you now that you're doing your woodworking at home? <laughs> uh, well, it's funny. I mean, I used to get into work, you know, like an hour early and maybe stay an hour late. Uh, now I'm work like right on time, you know. <laughs> so and five o'clock. See you later. So. Um, it seemed like I was at work a lot more, but I'm probably more productive now that I'm not. Uh, uh, goofing around in the shop quite so much, but uh, but it's so, nice. Now, now your shop, of course, it, it is. It's a detached um, garage. Yeah. What do you think the advantage or disadvantages are of having? I mean, I think there's some obvious answers there, but uh, to having it attached, you know, to where it's not attached to the to your house, and you 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 are you know trudging not far, but a few feet outside yeah. to the. I think the, the biggest downside was just the challenges in getting it insulated. 
Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, in an attached garage, you at least have at least one of your walls is insulated. You can sort of bargain. You can uh, take advantage of the heat generated by your heating system in the house itself to partially heat the your your shop. So where I think if you insulate an attached garage, you may be able to get by without some supplemental heat or maybe just some electric space heaters or something like that. But yeah. um, the upside is that obviously noise is not an issue. Um, right. uh, vibration, uh, I don't get yelled at to if I'm running the planer at 10 o'clock at night or something like that. And uh, That's a wonderful thing. Yeah, and yeah. dust. I'm not tracking, you know, quite as much dust and, and sawdust and that kind of stuff into the house. So, and plus there's, I like that physical separation. I like sort of looking out the, the window of my backyard and seeing my shop and I like walking to the shop and unlocking the door. Um, it's, uh, I like how close it is, but it's just far enough away to sort of create a different sense of space. So that okay. said, uh, that said, neither of our cars in 16 years has ever seen the inside of, the, <laughs> of a garage. So, yeah, I, I'm a, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll agree with that. My wife's car or mine has never seen the inside of a yeah. garage. I don't know. I think Chris, your wife used to get garage space, didn't she? We we uh, for for a while, I had half the two car garage as my shop, and the other half was her car. And and finally, one day, I said. Honey, we have to sit down and talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> the rest of the house is yours, but uh, the car's got to go. I'm running seriously out of room. <laughs> so, so now I've I've completely taken over the. You know, it's it's a shop now. But the All problem right. that I have is is the exact same things you talked about. Is you know because it is in the house, it's there's two issues. You know, it's one is a lot of times I'm I'm working in there late at night or something mm -hmm. and just noise. I mean, the kids' bedrooms are straight above, above the shop. And then okay. we also, we, we tend to use, we tend to come through the house, through the garage. We don't go through the front door. Most of the time we open the garage door up and walk okay. in the house that way. So right. I'm constantly having to clean because otherwise dust is always tracked inside the house. So, okay. uh, so I have to keep a clean path all the time. It, it makes me keep the shop cleaner, I guess. <laughs> Now, do you have to worry too much about uh, heating or insulation where you're at? Does it get all that cold? You know, it 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 you know Atlanta it does get cold. It it's not like <laughs> of course up there, there, but it it but it does. You know, we we still get cold. Um, we really don't get. You know, I'm from up in North Carolina, the mountains, and it definitely gets. We had a ton of snow and and ice and. But Atlanta, yes, it does. But at the same time, I mean, I, I've got a little electric, one of those little electric heaters that I put in there, and the shop's fine with just that. I mean, it's, okay. I don't, I don't need anything. Matter of fact, the, the most difficult thing I have is the summertime. It's just, oh, it's okay. just cooling. Yeah, you know, that's that's the that's the brutal part. But wintertime, it's no issue. Okay. Now, Mike, I've got kind of a split between you both. I have an attached garage in my shop, but when I was renovating rooms, I eliminated the door, the internal passageway door to the garage. So the only oh. way I can get there is by the external garage door. And as lame as this sounds, in the dead of winter, the hot 12 feet I need to walk <laughs> underneath a soffit from the house to the garage, if it's wet and nasty outside, it's sometimes enough to keep me out of the shop. Does the warm, dry shop beckoning you, is that enough to entice you out of the house? Or do you get the same thing where you're looking at the 18 inches of snow between your back door and the shop door? Does that, does that scare you away sometimes? Oh, no. Well, if there's that much snow on the ground, it's probably a snow day and the kids are home from school. So I've got my wife. She's getting driven crazy by the kids. My daughter is doing her thing, blasting her music. And there's enough going on where yeah that is that sort of that beacon in the night you know <laughs> that little trudge through the snow it's, just, it's a nice little separation there so yeah i like that it's part of the romance i like the idea you know the first thing i shovel and it probably shouldn't be this but the first thing i shovel is the path from the back door to the to my shop and I, there's nothing perfect. wrong with that yeah um so as as far as um as as far as upgrades, um, what did you do as far as electrical and and upgrades in your shop? Uh, when we we um after we'd been out here for a while, one of the first things I did was uh, put an electrical panel, uh, 
breaker box in the shop and have it wired for my 220 equipment and uh, and then installed just a three uh, eight foot um, uh, fluorescent fixtures which uh, really wasn't adequate it was enough you know basically it was better than a bare light bulb but it was still a pretty uh, daunting working situation and, now, um, at, at that time Mike was the inside just like gray cinder block or was it at yeah. least painted white no it was gray except okay. for except for a quarter of one wall that I tried to paint white. And if you talk about, you know, your, your plywood being porous, try, <laughs> try painting a cinder block wall. It's just like, it won't stop, you know? So I think I, you know, I burned through one of those five gallon buckets of paint and half a wall and, and oh. it looks sort of like a, uh, sort of, it look it resembles sort of a third world prison cell for the most part. <laughs> it's just not pretty. So, yeah, so yeah. that was, um, and actually when I, uh, uh, but it, as uncomfortable as my shop was when I first moved out here, all I had was just one uh, regular 110 outlet. So all my big equipment was pretty much unusable. So that's what actually prompted me to get more into hand tools because the only one of my machines that actually worked was my 14 inch bandsaw. Um, all my other stuff, joiner, planer, table saw, all the stuff I learned on, that was out of commission. So um, I learned pretty quick that with just a bandsaw and uh, some hand tools, you could sort of get moderately straight, flat lumber and build something out of it. And it took a lot longer to do, but I'm sort of more proud of those pieces than a lot of other pieces that I've knocked out on machinery in uh, half the time. So, um, And ever since then, you know, obviously I love my machines and I'm back on 220, but uh, my hand tool collection certainly hasn't shrunk in the meantime. Yeah, I'm looking at all those planes behind you. You seem to I love know. them too. Is that sad? I should maybe like move this, you know, <laughs> is that just so anyway. No, I'm showing off my sewing machine. Side. You can show off your hand planes. Okay, sorry. So um, go on, No, I was just gonna say, um you know, the last time we were up you, you had you had some cabinets or I can't remember exactly what you're building, but you had that shop slammed full of stuff. Um, oh yeah, you know, a lot of tools and, and a lot of stuff in there. How how important is is it in your shop to have uh, some of your tools, you know, mobile to where you can move and shift things around to reconfigure the shop to to the project that you're working on? Um, that's a that's a great question. Actually, I'm my stuff is not all that mobile. Um, mm -hmm. That was yeah, what you're referring to was a, a really one of the, the bigger built-in projects that I've done. A lot of sheet goods, a lot of boxes stacked up all over the place. Um, what I do keep mobile is I have a couple carts where if I have a couple projects going on, I'll try to load those on mobile carts so I, at least I can sort of push those things out of the way. And uh, right. really the, the thing for me, I've learned is to uh, keep the shop really clean. Um, the minute things start to get cluttered up, you start to lose, um, you know, storage space and, and tabletops once they get cluttered or workbenches, it becomes unworkable. So um, probably the, the main way I've dealt with working in a smaller shop is just, to, you know, I'm always just putting tools away in between different tasks rather than just waiting for a whole project to be done. Okay. No, that's 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 a good point. I mean, I think it's you, you can never keep keep everything at. I know sometimes I feel like I clean up my shop more than I actually make anything <laughs> in it, but it it makes a huge difference when you're actually trying to work and yeah. you have space and you know where the tools are and you. you oh, it's so. it's a delight to have room for your project and be able to reach your tools. I, it sounds so basic, yeah. but it is it's, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Um. All right. Well. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, one of the reasons – oh, go ahead. No, no, I'll, I'll, by all means, you're the guest. Finish. Oh, I was just going to say, and this doesn't really pertain to an average shop, but we do do a lot of photography and a lot of video work in the shop. So one of the main reasons I have some mobile machines to move around is just because um, basically the wall you see behind me, it looks kind of nice, and that's – it's sort of like – the other three walls of the shop are, are just sort of a cluttered wreck, but this is like I always make sure when we're <laughs> shooting – Oh, it's a nice window in the background and the tools. And uh, so I do have some stuff on wheels just to get out of the way, just to get the cameras in and that kind of stuff. But um, sort of along those lines, uh, 
Chris, in terms of, of making do in a smaller space, it's sort of giving up on the notion that of the perfect shop, the idea that every tool is equally accessible um, whenever you need it. And the bottom line, the, the, the hump that I finally got over is I kind of faced the fact that, look, some of my stuff, like my lathe, I'm on it maybe once every six months turning some drawer pulls or something like that. So guess what? I'm going to pile some stuff in front of it. And when I need to move it to use it, I'll get it out of the way. So, you know, the notion that I'm just not going to be able to access everything I want. So let me, what are my priorities? What tools am I using on a regular basis that I need to get to all the time and the rest of the stuff, if something's in the way, so be it. I can work around that. Good point. Yeah, I think that's true of almost everyone, is that yeah. you never have the space to reach all your stuff. Um, but w one thing we asked of most of our guests is a series of, of five questions. And uh, we've already asked you the first one in terms of how you got into woodworking. Okay. But I wanna, I'm going to close this out by going through the, the remaining four questions. So, um, Chris, you want to jump in with the first question? Um, sure. Yep. And so, so our I first question throw you off on that is, <laughs> you, you threw me in. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> what's the question? Uh, what, what's, what's your favorite tool? Uh, you know, we, we do a little bit on our show, sort of like all time favorite tool of the week, you know, and I'm always picking something, you know, I'm always trying to be a, a bit of the philosopher when we ask that question. It'll be something like blue tape. Or it'll be, you know, my broom. Or you know, um, I don't know. If push came to shove, uh, my shop. There you go. That's, that's, <laughs> I was I actually thinking it. of a book. But you know what? I'm that's, that's, that's a song. great answer. Uh, I, I think you know that the shop is sort of the easy out. If we if we really say you know pick a tool, um, probably my uh, number four Lee Nielsen smoothing plane because. Um, it does a good job. I use it a lot. It's a nice tool. It also has um, some sentimental value in terms of um, the way that I got it, um, the person that gave it to me. So uh, I think a lot of my the tools that I, I really like and I use all the time, um, usually there's some other reason other than just the performance of the tool itself. My dad, um, he always, when he learned that I I like woodworking and hand tools, man. Every yard sale and flea market he went to, and he found an old tool, he'd buy it and mail it to me. It's like, ah, oh, thanks, Dad. And I had like, you know, 27 rabbit planes or, <laughs> you know, all these broken, rusty tools. So, you know, for a while it was like, man, eh, sort of like, what am I doing with all these? But I still have a few of those things around. And, uh, you know, to be able to pick up a tool and it reminds me of your dad or uh, someone close to you, um, that's a really cool thing. Right. So. Uh, no, that's a good point. That's a good that's, point. That's that's great. Of, you know, tools. I think. And you know, it's funny. We always ask this that that question as far as what's your favorite tool, and and it, it is such a because it, I think if you ask any of us weekly, just like you guys, what our favorite tool, it's going to change. It constantly changes. Yeah. Seems like you know, it's it's what I'm what I'm using, and uh, you know, it, it's so hard just to pick one that because we do have emotional connections or. or or just like to use certain tools, so um, great. Yeah. What's your favorite tool this week, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> this week, um, let's see. What is my favorite tool this week? Well, I, I I guess this week I would have to say my table saw, and I never say my table no. saw because <laughs> I use my table saw, but I don't right. primarily focus on my table saw. Sure. I use my table saw to do the rough work, and then. But you know, with with this little box and stuff, I've actually used my table saw for almost all of it. I mean, I pulled out some shoulder planes to to clean some stuff up, but um, I haven't done a whole lot of a lot of my hand tool stuff lately, okay. especially with that end grain. It's hard to <laughs> you know, it's a little more difficult to do with. So right, so that. right. that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I, if you were to, to uh, uh, ask me for this week, um, I probably my favorite tool this week uh, is my biscuit joiner, which is probably like one of the more really? low, lowly considered tools in a shop. Like people yeah. say, is that even woodworking? It's like, oh yeah, biscuit <laughs> joiner is great. But um, it's got a yeah. place. 
Yeah, and I even for furniture making, I was telling you I was making these bathroom cabinets, and they have a fixed shelf and a divider for a couple of drawers, and you get a little spacer block and a biscuit joiner, you knock those suckers out, and uh, you fit those in there. And um, Yeah, it's one of those fun little tools. Again, I never think of my biscuit joiner as my favorite tool, but every now <laughs> and then, you know, that some tool comes in handy for the, for the right task, um, and whether it's a pencil sharpener or a biscuit joiner or a table saw, it's like, glad I have it. It was like they yeah. laughed at me the day I told them that my uh, my drill press was my favorite tool. <laughs> like, a drill press? Yeah, I love my drill press. I use it. <laughs> I use it for a sander more than I do drilling, but yeah. I still use it. <laughs> well, Mike, who has influenced you the most in your woodworking? Um. You know, I guess in short, um, wow, that's a great question. I mean, in short, I'd say Fine Woodworking Magazine um, in that uh, when I was, so I did a lot of woodworking in college, and then uh, I sort of had uh, this career in a band where I wasn't doing any woodworking, moving from apartment to apartment. All my shop stuff was in storage. And so um, my only connection to woodworking at that point in time was Fine Woodworking Magazine. And I read it um, just because it connected me to the craft. It, it sort of maintained that identity of, yeah, this is what I am. This is what I do. I'm not doing it now, but this is really still a, a, a big part of, you know, why I'm passionate about this craft. And then, obviously, when I came to the magazine, it was like, oh, my God, I'm at Fine Woodworking Magazine. Um, it took six months before I even got up the courage to step out in the shop and, and cut a board. Um, I was so intimidated. And and then beyond that, um, you know, most of the editors go out, uh, in an author, someone like Chris Bexford or Garrett Hack or any awesome woodworker will write an article for the magazine and an editor will be assigned to the story. And they'll typically go out and photograph the article. but. As an art director, every now and then, I get to sort of weasel my way into a photo shoot. And if I get a chance to visit Garrett or Chris Bexford's shop, I'm the first thing I'm doing, I'm opening up all the drawers in their shop. I'm looking through their scrap <laughs> piles. You know, I'm just like looking at everything I can. What's this? How do you do this? And um, so just that, you know, that experience of um, meeting these guys, poking around, seeing what they're doing, seeing they're just, they're just, guys they're just guys in shops and um, right. um, one of the biggest things I learned from watching these guys is how very slow not I mean they're not inefficient but they're very meticulous and certain tasks they really take their time and, um, and are, are very careful in their work and um, that was a big lesson for me you know you sort of bang through a dovetail joint and be all gappy. It's like, oh man, I can't cut dovetails. And then you watch someone who's really, really good at it and how meticulous and precise they are and say, oh, well, let me give this another shot and let me kind of slow down and, and pay attention this time around. And that was a, a huge learning experience. And just my job as an art director, basically I get manuscripts um, that I have to read over five times to sort of get an understanding of, of what's there. And then basically my job is to take that information and organize it in such a way that hopefully you can pick it up, pick up the magazine, scan through it. And in just a 30 second scan of a six page article, you say, Oh, I get it. And then maybe you'll, you'll read the captions for the photographs and you'll say, Oh, I get it. And, it, and to a different level. And then maybe two years later when you actually want to build a project and read through it all the way through, you get a deeper level of information. So, um, as long as I had subscribed to Fine Woodworking, I honestly say I never actually read the whole thing cover to cover. And it wasn't until I got to the magazine working there that, you know, in order to, there's a this great notion where in order to explain something simply, you have to understand it deeply. So mm -hmm. I've been just sort of forced by um, my profession to have to sit down and slog through everything from bent laminations to veneering to vacuum press bags to carving ball and cloth feet. And that you know, sounds really rough having to learn all those things. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, yeah, not that I've, I've ever put all that knowledge to use, but uh, 
uh, it certainly deepened my understanding and, and more than understanding and appreciation for man it's a it's a such a broad ocean of um, information of knowledge of skills necessary to be competent at this craft mm. um, and it's very humbling so you know I, I, I just try to narrow my focus you know uh, and just try my best to do basic work but try to do it to a certain level of expertise without any uh, any pretensions or, or notions of greatness just because I've seen too many good people doing awesome stuff so that's okay just you know Keeps my head on straight. I think it is that that's a that's a valuable lesson because there's so much out there, and I think that is just reflected just in the different niches of what woodworkers do in terms of guys who are you know tons of veneer work or or lathe work or scroll sewing or whatever. There's so many different divergent paths that all fall within woodworking. Absolutely, yeah. Where one group could even sneer at the other and say that's not really woodworking but it is all woodworking and it's too much to be a master of it all so there's I think there's a lot of value in figuring out what part you want to focus on and just learn that simple part the best you can because yeah. you spread yourself too thin trying to know everything about it yeah exactly alright so the next question is what was your biggest stumbling block and uh, how could it have been avoided in your woodworking Ah, biggest stumbling block. Give me an example. What do you like? My biggest mistake, or or no, just, something? Just, no, just just more so. It, you know, what was there that moment that you go, you know, hey, oh, yeah. I got it. You, yeah, you know, just kind of that aha moment, and and yeah. Know. I mean, when you put it that way, absolutely. It was um, one of my first photo shoots for the magazine. I headed out to uh, Mendocino to. Um, direct a photo shoot for James Credoff the last time he was on the cover for the magazine. And uh, he was doing an article on making a little wooden hand plane as, as part of a little bio piece he did. And one of the instructors there, David Welter, who's a great woodworker, um, he basically was the very first person who put a sharp hand plane in my hands. And up until that time, I didn't get the whole hand plane thing. You guys are crazy. You know, this is all, this is a waste of time. And he gave me a plane, and I gave it a try. It's like, wow, okay, got it. Now, I, now at least I know uh, what I'm after here and what they can do. If I ever get it this sharp, you know, now I have an expectation of what this can do. So that probably was, you know, one of the very first, you know, pushes down that that hill, you know, which hasn't stopped in terms of getting more and more into hand tool use and getting sharp and seeing what, you know, what these old tools tuned up in the right way can really do and why these guys did such fantastic work with these mm. rather primitive looking things. And that's a, and I think that's the common, that, you know, as far as, uh, you know, what is sharp? I think, you know, when, if you've never been around a hand plane or chisels or any of that stuff and, and you pick one up that's from Home Depot and pick up a cheap chisel in there and feel the edge of it, oh, it's sharp. It feels yeah. sharp. Yeah, you know, yeah. it would cut me if I'd stab myself with it. You know, but, <laughs> that's about all it would cut. But, but you don't realize what really sharp is, you know. And I think that's one of the great things about having events and things around where you've got, you know, the Lee Nelson guys travel around, and you've got all these other great shows and stuff where, you know, you've got people there with hand planes that are really sharp, and and yes. people can actually get to just to feel what that feels like. And yeah, it's a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. And as much as I love my Lee Nielsen and, and Veritas hand planes, usually when I'm demonstrate or teach, I'm pulling out my old Stanley Bailey with a hawk iron in it because I don't want the first tool, the first sharp hand plane to someone to use to be a $300 hand plane and right. somehow equate the performance of this plane with the fact that they have to go out and spend 300 bucks. So. Well, let me just ask you a question about that to get a little tangential because we've, we've kind of talked about this subject before. If you're if you're starting off and you you're interested in woodworking but you're not sure what that really tuned up sharpened hand plane feels like, are you better off going the route of getting a, a Stanley and making it work or or jumping into that, that first three hundred dollar plane so that now you have a plane that works and then you can f then you have a, a control to judge against and then you can go and buy a Stanley and, and learn to make it work? 
Yeah, I mean, great question. I think the problem with with picking up, a, you know, a flea market Stanley with an aftermarket blade, it's a pretty big stumbling block. Now that there's so many good quality and even you know less expensive good quality planes on the market now, um, you know, Wood River has a good quality plane, uh, even the Veritas planes. It used to be okay, I'm spending 30 bucks plus a $40 iron for a Stanley, or I'm paying 250 bucks for a Lee Nielsen. That was like the big gap. But now, um, you know, you can get a, a good hand plane. I don't probably for maybe 150 bucks on up. And the last thing I want is for someone to get an old plane that's sort of a beater. There's something fundamentally wrong with it that is going to keep them from getting good results with it. And then you start throwing good effort after bad and you still never quite get there. So um, now I guess my, my short answer is get a good quality new plane because it's five minutes to get sharp and you're making shavings. Um, and then from there, you know, if you're a romantic and you got some old tools and you, and you want to tune them up and get going, you know, that, that's kind of a, a different route, and I understand the uh, passions involved there. But if you're really looking to um, get up and running with hand tools and, and really make something, um, I'd say probably start with new tools. Uh, even if it costs a little bit more out of pocket up front, I think it's going to save you in time and frustration. And there's no learning curve to spending money. There's a learning curve to making the plane work. That's right. The learning curve is getting it from the from the car or the mailbox to your shop undetected. Yeah. That's, the... <laughs> That's why I have an office. <laughs> uh, is this my question or yours, Chris? I've lost track. Go for it. All right. So I think it's yours, a, buddy. All right. This is our last question. Okay. Um, how has the internet influenced your work? Um, I think the, the internet, for me, um, it's a tremendous resource for uh, design ideas, for inspiration. Um, uh, for instance, I was just, it's like you go and Google medieval furniture. And boom, there's like, I'm finding this guy's slideshow who went to, you know, I don't know, Bavaria or, or Germany or something like that. And here I am scrolling through dozens of medieval German wooden cabinets and you see these awesome wrought iron hinges and this incredible woodworking. And uh, so for me, um, as a woodworker who really uh, puts a lot of emphasis on design, um, uh, that's probably one of, the, one of the main things. Oh, check it out. See? So actually, um, what I was really interested in is, is I, I really wanted to make some Hobbit furniture. So <laughs> I figured that uh, sort of like English medieval style furniture was probably the basis for most of the set decorators for the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings movie. So I was sort of looking uh, for original sources for that. But uh, Hobbit furniture. Oh, maybe my cabinet will show up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, it doesn't show up. Oh well. I think if you did you uh, call it Hobbit furniture? Uh, what I call it? I think I did call it like a hot. Oh, there it is. There, it's like the fourth row down, second from the right. That little wall cabinet. This one. Yeah, that one right there. Well, there you go. It's on FineWoodworking.com. There it is. The Hobbit cupboard. Uh, and those hinges and that little leaf nice. pole. They were, they were made by a blacksmith. Uh, friend of mine that I met at Peters Valley Craft Center and he's a very interesting guy. He's, he specializes in making like knives and spears and this really crazy stuff. I said, can you make some hobbit hinges for me? Yeah. I said, I said, yeah, no problem. The... <laughs> That's great. Yeah. All right. Well, Thank you very much for coming on, Mike. We've taken up uh, enough of your evening. Um, as we wrap this up, is there anything you'd like to promote or share with everyone? Uh, no, absolutely not. I'm just not. A... <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for having me. This has been a blast. I enjoy your shows and uh, enjoy your company. This has been really fun. Well, well thank you. We've, we've really enjoyed having you on. And if Mike's not going to promote himself, I will. Uh, <laughs> you can certainly look at all his work in every issue of Fine Woodworking. Uh, as we said before, what brought this interview on was the recent Fine Woodworking Best Workshops book, which is all about lots of different workshop projects. It's a good primer on all facets of workshop design. And to be a little self-promotional, uh, the last three 
posts I've had on penultimatewoodshop.com have been my long overdue shop tour of my shop. So uh, today, the 8th, the video finally posted. So if you go to penultimatewoodshop.com and look for Mike Pekovic, you can see uh, the notes and the video that we shot when we visited his shop uh, in, I think, February of last year. Awesome. Hey, can I get one of your guys' uh, blue t-shirts by any chance? Hey, we'll get Absolutely. you a blue t-shirt, most definitely. All right. Awesome. I'll, I'll wear it with pride. <laughs> It'll come your way. Okay. Uh, ex extra large, please. Yeah. Extra large. <laughs> yeah. Got it. You got it. All right. All right. Um, next week's topic, or in two weeks' topic, the next topic, I believe, is going to be Bruce Wang of Microjig. But I'm saying that unconfirmed because uh, Tom, who's not here tonight, is our liaison with Bruce. So if Bruce isn't here in two weeks, I apologize, but he is on the board to be coming up, and I believe he'll be there in two weeks. Um, so, if not, we'll make something up. Yeah, we'll just talk about shop design again. <laughs> uh, so that's about it for, it for the show. If you're missing us already, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes. Just search for Modern Woodworkers Association. Once you're subscribed, you'll be sure never to miss an exciting episode. When you're in iTunes, please leave us a five-star rating. It helps our rank so that others can find us more easily. And if you want to find out more about the Modern Woodworkers Association, be sure to visit modernwoodworkersassociation.com or follow the MWA on Twitter at MWA underscore national. You can like the MWA on Facebook or circle Modern Woodworkers Association on Google+. And while you're there, join the MWA Google Plus community for project sharing discussion and loads of woodworking banter. And now you are Mr. Adkins. I am Chris Adkins of High Rock Woodworking and you can find me on Twitter at <laughs> High Rock WW and yeah, about 50 other places that Diami just named. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, I'm Diami Plotke of penultimatewoodshop.com. I'm on Twitter at Diami Plotke, D-Y-A-M-I-P-L-O-T-K-E. And uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I have not been the shop.